Yeah, yeah, what's their name again? Sleaford, hang on. Sleaford Mobs. I can't hear it so loud. That's it, anyway. Sleaford mobs. So they're from Sleaford, some, you know, uh, dead end town. Where is it? I don't know. Sleaford. Something like Bex Hill or. Uh, I don't know if it's like their, their accent. I, I'm, not, I'm not very good with accents. Um, I didn't hear enough there. Yeah, it's kind of um, that theme of... Grim. Yeah, delighting in, in the grimness of one's reality is... Um, He's quite problematic, and that's what he he. When we were talking about Mark Fisher, that's what he identifies with a num with lots of other references of people who are commenting on this. And he says, "Well, actually, there was a the the sixties seventies potential for different um, kind of culture, kind of systems, communitarian type things." And he's analysing those things and looking to their what failed um, and why it failed and you, for example you had people who would go and live in a, a commune for a couple of years and then if they didn't um, those would usually fall apart and then people would go back to their normal lives and um, so the practical consequences of actually living in an alternative system um, gets co-opted and sold back into the mainstream culture. So then 20 years later, we actually uh, live aspects of this and um, everything's hunky-dory because the actual whole capitalist system will never reform so that there's actually very little political consciousness left. And consciousness raising can happen and there's this very nice quote where he talks about um the kind of mocking of people who would say well what are you going to do then as the working class you're going to go and sit in the pub and talk about how to work set the world to rights as if that is the 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 thing that the system would the biggest danger to the system is simply that that you talk about the system and you raise consciousness through what they would say is ridiculous, that people would meet up. And that anti-intellectualism that says, well, there's no point talking about anything. All you're doing is just getting drunk and having fun. And um, that's like all you're allowed to do um, in this system would be human converse communication is actually meaningless so it's not you can't raise consciousness through speaking to others you can only fall into de degradation and then you've got your drugs and you've got your alcohol and uh, you have your culture which is about celebrating your own fall um into that and i think that's what we've been packaged and sold through the 20th century our um, own fool buying our own fool yeah and i like the, to make a kind of culture and, and um religion of celebration of one's own fool or humanity's own fool and i i think it's a tricky subject because if there is no desire for change of any <laughs> 
what who are these people that are advocating um um advocating for change is the how does that work so they're talking about the the vacuousness of local change and then on the other hand the vacuousness of speaking of theoretical abstract change which ends up as a very opaque occult academic texts that a few people might read but it there's a kind of pervasive passivity that then comes from this so um those are kind of the coordinates of many things i think that one could one could look at if if the overarching theme is what we're talking about which would be what comes next or what what maybe not even what comes next but what is evolving within the moral and spiritual development of what we see unfolding around us in in history or are we supposed to just not ask these questions and just go and and um just delight in um in uh in what's going on whereas well, yeah i mean the flip side is that mark fisher killed himself yeah and i think i think the problem is is, is um he felt a desire for change but um the the apple of your eye is only as good and as fruitful as the insights that you have into it in 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 the sense that um that it, it's it's really thinking that is the father of desire because or the imagination so if there's no real imagination or thought or insight of how things could be different, your desire essentially is going to, 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 to be barren. There will be no real birth, which I guess is why he, you know, he, he, he felt that people were desireless for change because they don't have the proper sense of how things could be different. As you said, um, early on, it's almost like capitalism can never reform itself and capitalism will just swallow everything, you know, like it swallowed the arts, it swallowed all beauty, it's swallowing the media, you know, it's swallowing all truth and reportage. And it's all just becoming commodities that, you know, the biggest monopolies can, can, can conquer. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and I think so in the sense of capitalism, we need for our desire for change to arise, we need to have the goal in sight. And, you know, the goal is out there, but it, it, it's it's, you know, we, we sort of left it behind a um, hundred years ago mm -hmm. um, in the wake of the Versailles Treaty and Keynes's insights. And, and Steiner's insight into economy and how capitalism will be reformed. Mm -hmm. and, but because not enough can see that, I think, yeah, you might sense that the desire is just not there because it's got nowhere else to go except kind of hedonism or, you know. But could, could we just, um, because that's quite, that's very bleak. And I think it would be good to just to say, well, are not every every attempt to actually conceive, because if we just said, well, then we give up conceiving or trying to perceive how these things fit together. And that's when you get turned away, isn't it, from the threshold. That's when you say, okay, I don't, if you would say that the angelic realm wants to to think in us imaginations for the good of humanity yeah and if we were then to say we can't manage that um it's forlorn and these were voices crying in the wilderness and even this latest 
profit of thinking about how these things might fit together, Mark Fisher, we then see, okay, at some point he just ended up um, from one year to the next, suddenly getting very depressed and then ended his life. When one can get quite um, bleak, I think. So I think it's, it's important also to hold on to the beauty of anyone, even if we go to the Seaford uh, mm -hmm. mods, or yeah, that any artist or thinker that, that tries to conceive and tries to deal with these issues is something that something beautiful in terms of of a humanity at trying to yeah, navigate these times true. and i think that's important to say that at the outset yeah. and just to take back reclaim that territory which would say there's no point in in conceiving or attempting to go further into these into these subjects and also to take back the fact that it doesn't have to be so bloody complicated because to take that back and say i want to bring back the ability of people to talk about these things without having to to quote leotard and broadyard and um uh thinkers of the left that can get so obtuse and complicated and then you've got 600 pages well, yeah. of the analysis of libido when you could just talk about this quite a bit more upfront and straightforward and just talk about well mark yeah. fisher for example did he have so little libido in the end that he killed himself and what was that perhaps because he read too many was was getting so lost in in the headiness of French uh, postmodern philosophy. Well, I I think he 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 probably had a vast libido for that, as the French postmodernist philosophers do. But it's it's only within the sphere of thought. It hasn't the libido hasn't broken to that sphere behind you where thought is living being, and so it can become actual reality. And there you would have you would just have such desire for you know those those horses of change to gallop into capitalism you would feel it as a reality that can be rather than just imagining them as mere thoughts do you know what i mean without any possible yeah that's fascinating because that aspect of the will i mean we see it in the galloping horses behind here that instead and again this beautiful artwork this painting is is a kind of alternative to that instead of like like you're saying instead of falling into matter and um not recognizing that vast libido and i think that is great what you said is there is this vast libido in in french um continental philosophy to precisely do that to bring into word and image that those spiritual that vast spiritual and they would never want to say spirit but, but exactly but but that is what it's what's speaking out of them and then the struggle yeah. like how does that become will how yeah. does that vast libido form that those horses down into um into life into matter yeah. into our will yeah in through intuitive um practical reason through intuiting in the moment what is required and so it's never a plan or you know a model of how to reform capitalism or whatever it can only be through you know working oneself in in great love into all the details that one can and then being in life you know in one's position in life moving forward and when the moment you know having the insight into whatever moment th that that can begin to enter you know from where one is and then someone else do you not see what i'm saying in the, in the... yeah i think that's that it's really what you identify there is something that he brings which was what i re referred to earlier which was consciousness raising which can occur through this kind of um 
meeting of people that are looking to also raise consciousness of how all these things fit together and i think that's the that's an interesting aspect the social aspect of how this would occur and again i think it's interesting to take that out of the bounds of one or two universities that might run a course on what they call post capitalist desire um which is pretty alienating to um you know especially if you think that the co-opted working class of of uh, the the trump world or the brexit world or people just never you know you say something like post capitalist desire that's going to be a turn off um pretty major turn off but how you know how can we raise um consciousness um across the board not just not like right co-opted right left but to say to people we're all alienated and i think what they take off the the table which they refer to again and again you're given your ideologies but yeah um what about just talking about the vast sums of capital that are kept in a few hands and just keep on banging on about that without even getting into talking you know marxist means of production and and but just to say look there's vast amount of capital there what are we going to do just keep on producing new new um um farmer and new weapons that the a a a just kind of centered on death um or disease well why can't we actually use some of that those vast resources and and use them for the arts or for research into um yeah why why can we have that discussion please like in parliament in the united nations can we have a discussion like i want to see all of those billionaires and how much they um have profited and all of those tech companies and i want well can't we have a discussion you know without going into oh you're you're a communist or you're a socialist no i'm not talking it's not talking about that it's saying can we bring those things back to the table and yeah Um, yeah so you're saying like are uh, you raising this question here of christopher hooten buds an improbable conversation can you just outline what that is and how that might relate um uh at the end of the first world war where the old order was carved up and the new order of you know european which is the world order more or less was was brought in there was the treaty of versailles where someone was brought to blame or some nation was brought to blame and and a declaration of 14 points through a schoolmasterly manner of um what's his face the us president wilson uh, wilson um gave 14 points just very abstract things peoples must be free nations must not interfere with each other blah 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 but very fine words what does it actually mean do you know what i mean it's just lawyer speak that or whatever um doesn't mean anything unless at that time kane's rebuttal was the the um reparations they called it which was you know the raping and pillaging of germany which must happen because they are to blame of, of what happened economic raping and pillaging um keynes pointed out this will destroy europe because it's not germany's an economy on itself you can't just like all dive in like vultures and tear it apart it's a whole you know the economies of the world are completely interlinked so Keynes foresaw the destruction of the economies, and you know that would then be um, lead to a whole new regime, sort of being brought into place and springing out of that. And then Christopher um, puts alongside that 
at that time also Rudolf Steiner's 14 chapters of the world economy. So instead of blah, blah, blahing this, these abstract highfalutin nonsense that you know just lets you do whatever you want in reality, he actually pointed out how the world is an integrated single economy, what it actually means you know, to work for each other, what true price, how we could possibly discover the true price of anything and, and how culture, the art should be and must be disentangled from money, how you cannot put a value on health and education. Do you know what I mean? How those things mm. are to be funded. In reality, they are funded, but you know, instead we have this kind of vampire vulture system of capitalism where it's all just uh, tied down to, to sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, cordoned off amounts, you know, who's got the most amount can, mm -hmm. can, can, can dictate. Well, this, is, this is kind of like why I find it interesting some of the debates we've been having or reflections that we've been having on how we could even say it a bit like Christopher's improbable conversation between Rudolf Steiner and Wilson. And Keynes. And Keynes. If we, you know, updated that for a hundred years down the line and said, well, where would the debate be now? And that's what we've been trying to explore. What would the debate be now between the Great Reset, perhaps yeah, it's, the it's, United it's, Nations and, and Rudolf and Steiner? Us. And us, um, and us, and, us, and the Sleaford mods. It's between Schwab, Gates, and then us and the Sleaford mods and, and everyone else. That's the conversation there. Yeah, and that, that's what I find quite fascinating because it's not regurgitating Steiner. It's being aware of that inspiration, which was setting something against um, Wilson back then, and was shouted down, it, and was shouted was down. down. And looking, looking then at what's happened to our society in the interim period, and how do we, us, respond to it? Right down into our very lives and into our characters and what we do in life. And that I think is a again an improbable conversation yeah. that we can have now yeah. about not who because I, I like the way you've made that third pillar us yes instead of the 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 guru leader figure that we have to follow and rack our brains to understand it's recognizing the very wisdom that we contain in our own will in our own voice to speak and I think that is the difference between a hundred years ago and where we're at now and I think that's that improbable conversation and how that would play out now. And it's something that Mark Fisher also talks about. How can we motivate all of the people who are subordinate, subordinated groups in the present time? And how can we find unity between them, whether they're artists or people in religious um, movements, or even down to the, the different movements for race, gender, all of that. Is there not a unity from all the subordinated groups to raise their consciousness of the deeper lying um, situation in which we find ourselves? And that's, I think, quite a fascinating prospect about a more a far reaching um even if we want to reference anthroposophy um i say even because this is opening a whole world of um insight that is about not necessarily needing to to put yourself under the umbrella name of something um and i think those that's a very interesting conversation to have because you're looking then to build bridges towards a, a growing group consciousness. It's the only way to speak from oneself in one's own voice. 
not to preach from the Bible, wherever that is from, the anthroposophy or, or, or whatever. Every, we all have our own Bibles, and you know, the Sleaford mods will be the conversations, the graffiti, you know, on the way to the pub. And that's just as valid and has as valid insights as anyone else, do you know what I mean? Because they're all speaking out of the heartbeat of the world in all its different ways. But if we each speak in our own voice from whatever our Bibles are, then I believe we can do what you're saying to meet mm -hmm. in a conversation. Yeah, this is what I, I mean, I got a lot of warnings over the years about, oh, you shouldn't speak about anthroposophy on Facebook. And it's, I think it's one of the meekest in a negative sense, or one of the most scared gestures I've heard in in modern times. I, well, maybe that sounds sounds quite um, quite uh, overly um, uh, sarcastic or or something like that. But it's I mean, I understand cool. people's need for reverence, and they need to hold things in reverence, and and that places need their temples, and but. I think if you've grown up in the 80s and 90s and exactly like you say, if you've grown up in the world of graffiti, of video games, of our culture, of Hollywood films and music, why would you shut off all of those expressions of, of the spirit in life? And why would you not seek out communion with those others yeah it's so sad because it, when you're saying i'm not going to take my precious anthroposophy onto the internet or wherever down the pub then uh, okay yeah you, you can't you can't speak a, a, an anthroposophical lecture on the the street corner obviously or, or you know amongst a bunch of trolls who, who are just on the, the facebook to, to have a laugh but you to say that you don't want to bring it there is essentially to set to brush all those communities off and say i, I damn them to hell because if you think that you've got anything that is of value to the world then you're going to take it into the even the grimiest corners of the world do you know what i mean because the, the life is everywhere do you know what I mean? yeah. why, why damn everybody who, who who invests who's going to invest their whole future on the internet and, and so forth? You might not want to go there, fair enough, but but others will. <laughs> yeah, I always found it quite an interesting moment, like phenomenologically or spiritually, when you're actually someone who you're face to face with someone. And you say to them, oh, what do you do? And you say, oh, I write, um, I, I write about anthroposophy and I do some stuff on um, Facebook or YouTube. And then the person over against you is quite willing to then say, um, well, what you do is, is wrong. And I just find that quite interesting because if you said to anyone else in life, well, what do you do? Oh, I'm a postman. And you say, well, according to my ideolo ideology, post to be a postman is wrong. <laughs> it, it's like that's what how, it's just quite what fascinating to say. It's just quite fascinating <laughs> in that moment, like what goes through your soul. You're kind of frozen. Like what? Like is this what happened to manners? I, I, you know, I'm a big one for like manners, like human manners it's like oh you know what 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 do you do then well you know i um i care i i work in a care home well i think that we should all be digitalizing and that should be done by robots and it's like how how lacking in in empathy is that in that moment just for the human being i mean even if it was wrong even if you are wrong like yeah. okay i've made a major esoteric faux pas in i've i'm actually endangering my soul by by publishing things on facebook even in that moment you would if you were like a if you had like the compassion of of a buddha 
in that moment and you 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 would take me aside and say richard um i hate to break it to you but you're in in you're in danger of eternal damnation right now and uh, i mean again it's quite easy to see oh this is we're back in the the the, the catholic um needing to buy absolvences aren't we it's like can, can you direct me wrong, my son can you direct me to the ga where rudolf steiner and he and he did say you know you've got to be careful of the the whole digital world in the so anyway i would they would that yeah, would but, be quoted but, me and i would have to buy absolvence of my sin he for never having... said in a sense i don't believe he ever said you've got to be careful of the whole digital world he just simply laid it out it's going to be like this it's going to shrivel up your this and do this and that but that's just that's just facts do you know what i mean it's and he's like and then enter the belly of the beast be afraid be not afraid of anything do, do you know what i mean yeah your soul exactly. cannot be eternally damned or, or else well this is the it. thing that i you know it, it it there's two sides isn't there always it's like are you somebody who wants to bring uh anthroposophical or spiritual insights into your will or are you not are you, you or do you want to be a spectator and that's the thing you know steiner had to go into the to the skin of the dragon and learn about all of the thinkers of his age and was interested in contemporary for him the contemporary thinkers and what was going on in his age yeah and the other way is to say Oh, the dragon! Uh, don't go near the dragon. Yeah, and that's it, 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 it's fair enough because you, you 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 can in that moment you can feel their their fear, um, because there will be a fallen world. Do you know what I mean? People are going to fall below that, put themselves wholly into a subnatural realm. But okay, but that they are never going to be abandoned by the spirit, and so there will be living spirits human beings who descend into that also for their sake yeah so yeah, yeah. Do, do you know what i mean it's just um that 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 in if they say what you're doing is wrong that is expressing their position for themselves and their parameters they have set for themselves yeah it has no reflection do, do you know what i mean upon, upon i mean i think one of the great one of the things one can be perhaps quite grateful for is the ability is the experience of being in a community of people what we loosely call an anthroposophical world where experiences and judgments like this can be can be given to you in such a an overt way do you know what i mean that, that you, yes Maybe one can be grateful for that, because yeah, where else yeah. can you actually, I don't think even in the church, one would get that in the... It, it, it would be, it's fine in as much as then they allow us to sit in the same anthroposophical room as them and have a conversation. They're on one side saying, thou art wrong, and we're on the other, and okay, fair enough. <laughs> But at least we can talk to each other. Do, do yeah, I, it, that's if, beautiful. I think that's beautiful, the, the fact that that one can have that without being i mean of course you, you you could get excommunicated and people do get excommunicated but it's not immediate there's like a, a negotiation phase where <laughs> right. you know where you can you can go through socratic um, dialogue socratic okay. dialogue and inquisition so <laughs> anyway this is too easy it's, it's too, yeah. it is too easy but i i it, it's um i think these things are fascinating and again i like to bring these things back to the table also people's education back to the table about the tradition in which we stand and the spirit and the subjects such as jesuitism and and in the inquisition because they are vital to understand i feel but that's one of my my pet topics as you know so we don't necessarily have to <laughs> fire see that everywhere you know but it's yeah. um no, I, I, i'm wondering how it would all be for a, a mark fisher because 
um, from reading from his blog, I, I wouldn't get the sense that he would have much truck with anthroposophical speak as such. But I am absolutely certain that if you could speak to him in everyday language about a world economy and how true price might would look uh, 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 and you know the idea of of money dying and so it's impossible to hoard it he would understand immediately and and, and the, i think so and i think it. it's i think it's quite fascinating that that often these writers don't come to these um these ideas and these thoughts which is something also interesting to explore also like derrida and um why they don't why they didn't or haven't um come to these practical ideas of um and that's there are also instances in their lives where they do try to engage you know you think of um Foucault and his prison work and I don't know offhand um, but I know that there's instances also of Derrida um, and his own political act activism but I'm interested in why that didn't come like with Mark Fisher to to the more I wonder if they get captured in something that they also identify themselves of this of this danger of getting captured and that's one thing and on the other hand mark fisher himself said something that relates to what you just said which he called in an essay exiting the vampire castle mm. which was when he decided to get off twitter and he kind of called out the the inane vacuousness of everyone calling each other out for being privileged or um mm -hmm. unpolitically correct and he said look i'm gonna say goodbye to you guys i'm gonna go and do all my work now on a blog and okay this was 10 years ago um but i found i find that gesture um interesting too in relation to these these two aspects where can one meet to raise consciousness with others to bring these new ideas about how one does raise consciousness and the second idea about how that relates to the more um the more practical side of of change but i know that's really problematic and that's something he also picks up about the the failure of local action to address bigger systemic issues and the failure of theory itself to have practical um, implications where it becomes more and more obtuse and then all the criticisms of postmodernism and as being um, obtuse and purposefully, what was it, purposefully obscurantist I mean, even in the critic, you're getting into words that you're going to lose a lot of people with. But purposefully obscurantist was the the description of of Derrida, I think, um, by some on the on on the right. So you've got that that continental philosophy ending up in its kind of French um, hidden alembic or something while the rest of the world goes off doing its yeah. megatech capitalist neoliberal right. new age spirituality yeah where create, create yourself yeah so is there something indeed growing and brewing in that alembic of french philosophy i like to think i like to think there is yes it's that egyptian desert that we have to traverse you know what i mean it's that dry bony monolithic structuralism of the you know of inspiration that we have to just for, for it to have any solid body do you know what i mean right instead of being a vapid new age 
do what thou wilt and, and, and rule the world with your electro microsofties. Yeah, and that desert that we're all going through, and I think I think that is when that becomes unconscious for people, that's when you get all the mental health um right the mental health issues which are then going to have physical effect and the actual physical sickness and and things like that because yeah, yeah. because there's no if there's no consciousness raising there's no need to to think and there's no culture where you can actually engage with others on these topics your peers i think this is the i really like this idea of coming back to the importance of peers if there's no peer, if there's no one calling you to account uh, of your own consciousness mm. in the face of another, um, that human warmth, um, yes. I think that's when you can get, if you're unconscious of all this, I think that's when you get these, and this vast sea, even the United Nations says it, that you know the time we're going into, is climate change, mental health, um, Harry and Harry, what's, what's the other one? Markle. Harry and yeah, yeah, no, his brother, the the I, William. You know, Harry and William. You know, like uh, mental health, and I mean, Britain does this. I don't know any other country who's so up on that. You know, every second conversation on Good Morning Britain is about mental health oh my well, mental health you know it's funny because in that desert of like arid intellectualism it reminds me of the the desert fathers uh, the, 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 the early christians in the desert they used to go and they would sit in their sem they were called cenobites and they would sit in their individual cells greatly lacking that community that you're speaking of, and they would be assailed by great temptation and, and, and mental illness. Do you know what I mean? Lacking that, that, that community, it, it, they could come back, you know, God willing to community with great um, wisdom and gifts, but not always the case. I guess often one evolved into, you know, the Cenobites of the um, Hellraiser movie, <laughs> who they were called. Those demonic beasts that tear you apart. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With Pinhead and exactly. that's a very scary. That's really scary. I that's um I struggle to to watch that. Uh, he called them Cenobites. Oh really? Mm. Okay. Mm. And it reminds me of um Andrew, Saint Andrew, and when he goes out to meet um paul so he hears of another celibite xenobite -E yeah so he hears of another xenobite who is paul <laughs> who is like um apparently more advanced than himself and so he isn't that i find that quite fascinating that he then by however he finds this out, whether it's a message from the spirit or whatever, that he seeks out a path through the desert to go out and see Paul. And then their conversation is something, um, I have my, my friend Ronald Wurtrich always makes me aware of uh, this story um, about how, because he relates it always to what is, what is more beautiful than light you know, Goethe's conversation yeah, yeah. and that the purpose of his life then is a, a, a life of, of you see St. Andrew's uh, temptation in the desert and the, the paintings where you see all of the, the demons tormenting and torturing him and the raven who comes down and gives him the manna in the desert. Um, Locust and honey. Yeah, the, the Isenheimer altar is the is that that's the best representation of that and then he goes out to um he seeks out the paul and then there's this beautiful kind of blossoming of of 
conversation and i think that's mm. kind of sim is that not sim symbolic of what we're talking about when mark fisher talks of consciousness raising that one can live a life in isolation perhaps until the moment and i i think i had this also a bit in my in my own life of not realizing the choices that i was making to sit in conferences where i was bored out of my mind um and there was no dialogue there was no um or very little dialogue or dialogue that had regressed to um some of the things we were pointing out earlier that that had was lacking in in any insight and that people accept this and in a form of passivity where you know you have your forum you have the, the speakers at the forum and you sit there kind of, of that was two thousand years ago <laughs> 2500 years ago still are we doing that oh my god well i think it's even i think it's regressed even further than that but to to just rem remember the um you know the the beauty of plato's dialogues were were with different people the, the, the each different um person each person that he spoke to and unfolded those those dialogues each had their own specific take that that needed to be to be deciphered and like you know like andrew saying oh i must it's paul i need to see <laughs> but and also referring back to you know we're allowed our certain dialogues in a certain sphere but if it gets beyond a certain allowed realm then it's a threat and we'll be stamped out that pierre grimes speaks of how socrates he wasn't a threat while he spoke to the highfalutin folks but yeah. when he was in the street talking to the market stall owner owner what 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 do you what do you re really think that was what they objected to when it was at yeah the, every, every man who was being woke yeah up. i wonder this is the thing with mark fisher i wonder whether because what i'm fascinated in is how his suicide came about that it was just from one day to the next there's a very revealing passage where it says his wife contacted the nhs and the NHS, they were on a recorded message on a phone call and they said, well, there's not a lot we can do really, or please, um, it, you know, like the, 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 the vacuousness of coming in touch with the official organs mm. of, mm. of medicine and his GP referred him to a phone line, you know, call this phone line, you get a bit of counselling, you know, hopefully, hopefully, you know, have a bit of a chat have a chat have a cup of tea and you'll That'd be, be all right protocol. That's and the protocol in cases like this yes and it's <laughs> it's all we've got a wonderful phone line and you know by this then it it manifested kind of overnight like suddenly they would describe the sort of chemical imbalances that from one day to the next he'd lost the will to live and then there's the path to when he died. I don't know how he ended his life, but I'm interested in how that that happens. And when when was the point? If we took that Socrates and that analogy, when was the point where um, the paths into a, a speaking? Because that if you're saying that that's more dangerous to the system. All the while he's speaking about Leotard and Derrida and Delius, and um, that's kind of, he's not getting that resistance from the system. And okay, he makes the, the attempt at a block. Okay, but is there not a path where you would seek in a far more radical way to say, yeah, bring it on, yeah? to i mean not to get like doing some kind of actionist mm -hmm. thing out there but how, how can you say inwardly yeah if i'm gonna anyway end up ending my life like the chemical imbalances are going to shift at some point if you were conscious of that would mark fisher not say in response to your question about socrates 
and the man in the street. Where how, I'm just putting that as a as a question. You know what what would that look like if if he said, uh, "I'm going to go and do that uh, man in the street thing." Um, and maybe he was trying that a bit because you know he's interested in 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 um, like like you you're flagging up here with the Sleaford mods popular culture um, is that part of it or is that still missing something there's a lot of when a lot I of when we were nine ten they bought the effigy, the sarcophagi of Tutankhamun the third to London for the first time ever. Oh yeah, it was a massive to do. There was queues all around the place, and my mum took us up as a pilgrimage to see this influx into the heart of England, Londinian. And what was your impression on seeing that? I don't know, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, I liked museums, but I preferred castles more and like Norse knights and, and going to churches and, and doing brass rubbings on the um on, on their death plates. You know, that was a kind of thing. I remember that at school. Um, yeah. Brass rubbings must have been, I think every child in Britain had to do brass rubbings at some point. Exactly. For, wow. for, 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 for in my 15s and 16s, I would sleep like this, like, but, you know, their effigies in death of the nights. They're like lying on their tombstones like this. I would sleep like this. Oh, yeah. Dear God, please don't make me a rapist because I think I'm masturbating too much. <laughs> that was my, that was how I would go to bed. But this, this is real life. This is, this is, this is where we were. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's the down and dirty. Is that, that's also like Tutankhamun though. He, he also exactly, sleeps exactly. like that. With, exactly. What is it? Hook or crook? With the, yeah, hook, the yeah, hook yeah. and the crook. And yeah, I know what you mean. It's something like, um, I remember, I, I had a, a therapy and the beauty of Switzerland is that you get prescribed some of these anthroposophical therapies. And I was uh, prescribed an oil bath, Excellent. oil baths to work yeah. with my warmth ether. Oh, wow. And I would go in there naked in this um, bath at the hospital, like downstairs in the basement and a nurse <laughs> would come in with these brushes yeah and she would brush me in figure of eights wow on my body and um wow. quite challenging for a, a british person to go and allow this process to take place yeah and then afterwards she would i would be in there for 20 minutes and you do feel the whole warmth it's a certain temperature and it goes into the oil makes you connect to that or to the water yeah. and then afterwards i would be wrapped up oh, like a mummy like like this and to contain the warmth and i would have to lie there for half an hour and the whole rich i mean of course you can do this at home yes <laughs> hey kids you can do this you can do this at home but rhythmic massage we did it in the care home too yeah it's wonderful is it not but um the whole ritual of it and having someone else do it to you and then wrap me up like this if only I, mark fisher could have had that imagine yeah indeed and maybe that's an then, then, then he could have walked forth you know if he if he was mummified like that with all his derrida in that warmth and that love, would he then have been able to arise? Well, see, this is the thing. When you said, you know, Socrates speaking to the to the man on the street, and then we were struggling just now, if you look at what we were talking about, we were struggling to say, well, what does that actually look like, um, walking with the man in the street? And then you get still stuck in this abstract where, and what this example is an example of are not these some of these things physical, sensual, 
yeah, that is not that an answer. Exactly. To exactly okay. like that. Exactly. And even 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 to the homeopathic, which is completely immaterial, but it's still po completely po po powerful, potent, potentized into the ma material. Yeah. And so, I mean, again, you could say that process whereby um, I think it's quite fascinating it, to it's, imagine it's, exactly. what would, who, Sorry, would this, who would this resurrected Mark Fisher be? I if, just, but just before we go there, just to put that, that image of what you gave, the remedy you were given alongside at the end of a phone call, go and speak to someone else at the end of a phone call and maybe, you know, you can sit in a room and talk for a bit with someone against that real that mummification in, in love and warmth. That's two, yeah, and two I, quite different worlds, isn't it? Yeah, in I some approaches. in some NHS clinic um, with no art and, you know, old 1960s building. I mean, I'm not saying that the hospitals are in, this was in the hospital in Basel and it, it wasn't particularly, uh, it's not like we. I was surrounded with rose pink, right, right. auric, lazur, right. Right, right. Andrew Bazovigal Wall. Yeah, no, it could still be an antiseptic environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, but that's which, the thing. Which it should be when you're embalming, goodness. Do Indeed. But the, the very forms of those figure of eights and uh, uh, this woman who, who was so, um, that's her life. There was no debating about whether one's going to make a step into the, a spiritual view of life or, mm. or there's no dis debating about ideology or Leotard's libido. This libido is in this woman's very body and mm. being mm. and she's doing the figure of eights on your body. And to okay. be honest, I mean, to be honest and transparent, exactly what you are saying about the sexual side of this there, there is a sexual side. If when the libido, those figure eights of eights a that platonic we might... sexuality in reality, in bodily reality, not yeah, and not just when she would every week when she would leave me when I first got in there, if that the warmth that came through that oil and through that water into your etheric body, that warmth would flow flow through flow through you. And the fear always was for me, like, oh, my God, I'm going to get aroused from this warmth. And then the nurse is going to come back and she's going to, oh, Mr. Cooper, you know. Yeah. Um, Never mind. A kind of Benny Hill moment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then the towel falls off and you're running around. She's going, oh, sir. Yeah. <laughs> around the whole hospital. Exactly, and then reality comes back. Yeah, so I just about managed to to. Um, it's 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 fascinating how that um, it does activate that, and and just thinking of poor old Mark Fisher, mm. but who I don't know. Maybe we're being extra sentimental about this, and and he he said, you know, um, I'm going to very consciously end it now, but it didn't it didn't sound like that it sound like sounded like the very much the materialistic view of it i mean who goes who calls up the nhs like your gp and and this might again sound sound very harsh and very sarcastic and i apologize to anyone <laughs> no i'm not, I'm not going to go down that route but do you know what i mean do you know what i'm trying to say it did like i if i care it mm, if I was, if that was to happen to anyone I know, I, I don't, I wouldn't refer them to the, to the GP, you know, I would know that that's a, a kind of dead end. Um, but is that all we've got, you know, in many societies, mm -hmm. is that all we've got, especially in, in Britain, like where there's a bit of a desert of other ideas, you know, a poverty of ideas in Britain. You know, where is the other alternative right there and then that there would be other therapies that you could do? You don't just have to go to the depression counselling phone line. 
you that there would be other things that you do you know what i mean that's my just trying to figure out what what happened to this guy because i was very inspired reading reading like he's what i don't know of any other um anglo-american uh writer who who had gone into who had been who'd, so, such an advocate of that continental philosophy maybe i there are others i'd, I'd like he'd like to know if there's others you know um but he also seemed to, to combine it with a real feeling and will for people and society and how to how to affect the you know the spirit of what the continental philosophy was promising, you know, this mental turnaround into the societal turnaround. Yeah. You know, for, for people, not just for academia. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I've got a big bug there with um like Roger Stew. Have you ever read any Roger Scruton? Yeah. No, just it's heard on video. See, so, I mean, a lot of the time he's, he's very interesting and, and uh, love his stuff, but I was always taken aback by the book that he wrote about continental philosophy, where he just writes it, writes it all off as a huge scam. And um, I just find it, I find that a shocking thing to to position to be able to take um the just charlatans he calls them charlatans and fry, fire brands i yeah. think but then we come back to that what's it somebody keeps quoting it the the great gatsby writer said you know the sign of true intelligence is to hold two conflicting thoughts in your mind at the same time so it, you know to hold postmodernism and the yeah. enlightenment ideals in your mind at the same time and that's the only way surely that that those academics can go forward with that because i these, think so. these contradictions are in life and unless you know, i think we, yeah yeah and he says at the end of that quote to be able to hold those two contradictions in mind without cease ceasing to function right yeah and and, and scruton would have feared to function if he could embrace his opposite position I yeah i think so, so he, I had think, to, he had to push it away exactly and i think that's the um it's all well and good to remain safe in one's own uh tradition and then you can you have your position and everything's fine but if you seek to um to traverse or to to integrate the thing that you're denying uh or seeking to deny then you're faced with a threshold experience yeah and because it looks like you're fighting for two opposing flags at the same time. It's like, hang on, I'm, I'm a traitor on both sides. <laughs> How did yeah, this work? So you kind of shoot yourself in the foot. But... <laughs> and the head at the same time. I think it's, it's interesting what you're saying um, about if you're, what is he doing? Like to, to deny that what was that oh, i was just trying to say something about Scruton. to de that to deny something that actually exists yes exactly and i find that problematic in a in a human sense yeah. like a whole tradition of people who built their whole lives and in many cases died for them yeah. that one would deny the very reality of that out yeah. of a need to assert one's 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 view and yeah. i find that i find that um but that, tricky. that i mean then again thrilling. he did write a book he did write a book about it which is trying to to uh, but it's a book of defense like okay i will write this book to build a, a wall against those con the contagion okay. the, well, there we go, isn't it? It's that thing, them and us. It's the virus against us, us against the virus. That's never made the two be in the same room together, ever. I mean, this is crazy, though. If, if our artists or thinkers are doing that gesture, 
why are we surprised when then society manifests a, a virus that we have to protect everyone from you yeah. yeah, by by ending up as cenobites and only able to communicate digitally and never actually get together and build beautiful cathedrals like they did do do you know what i mean they did do they used to be traveling girls of just nobodies picking their noses between villages getting together and they each needed each other without each they would never have built those magnificent structures that are still there today and they can't be beat today you know yeah and then you had the the teachers who actually came and taught in those cathedrals you're talking about the gothic yeah the gothic cathedrals area i mean they're just Chartre, Notre Dame, all of these places the, the true masons the true free masons moving from village to village they, to where they were needed they were valued because they could embody the spirit in stone in a way that the teachers that came later couldn't but you know but 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 valued them so much for what what they could create where would you go mind. now like if you were a stonemason from that time and you'd been involved in those building projects where what, what would be do you think if that person then incarnated in our time what would they do do you think where would you see what would they be questions they would have what would their soul be like they'd either be a plumber or a youtuber yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think that's a good 